What is the WAVES network? Because everybody here is part of it in one way or another. It's actually basically a collection of projects through quite lengthy timeline now, focused around probably two linked areas, which is scenario-based learning and the use of scenario-based learning to transform didactic curricula. And uh, if you go through the last 15 years, these are all the projects, all the people involved in all the projects are here. All these groups actually have been involved in the projects in one way or another. More than 30 of them actually have been directly funded, and of those directly funded projects, probably around two-thirds of them are actually still here today, which is extraordinary, or represented today. But they're not just projects. Um, they're not just collectings of projects around um, one particular theme. They are also actually a timeline of development and progression and pedagogic, ped pedagogic progression as well. And I'd like to try and show you how that was put together. If we go right back to the beginning, um, it began with a project called EVIP. Uh, virtual patients were very expensive at the time to make. One uh, publication said that there were a minimum of 10,000 pounds, maximum of 150. And we got together a group of people to create a bank of virtual patients for sharing across Europe. That was quite successful. And it was really just looking at competency, the ability to teach basic and clinical sciences through a scenario. We hadn't got much further than that. And then there was a project called Meducator, which was about content repurposing. It was a much more technical project, and that contained a little bit of the same element of virtual patients about sharing virtual patients. But then we started to think that we should use the technology to get a lot more out of it in terms of decision making because here we had an interactive technology which we could use, and if we created proper scenarios, we could make students think. And we put this Georges into a project called Generation 4 as a kind of uh, pilot, really. We created interactive problem-based learning. Problem-based learning was already getting fairly old, frankly. It was about 40 years, 50 years old at that time. Although it was actually a good way of teaching students um, uh, based in clinical sciences. Um, the students could not actually modify the scenario as it came out, and so what we wanted to do was give them the chance to modify that scenario. And then having done that, we wanted to see it used elsewhere. And this is where the beginning of a different kind of project came in. EPBLNet was a curriculum transformation project which involved many people here, and I will come to that a bit later. We're starting to think much more in terms of clinical reasoning. And then a project called Croesus took what was the university-based um, interactive PBL and transformed that into clinical use for much more clinical reasoning context. And around that time, people were starting to get really concerned about patient safety. There was much more interest in simulation. There was then a little bit of uh, concern about human factors in error about uh, hospital failures, the generation of checklists to try and limit error, a lot of interest in team training. And so medical error was actually the next factor that became quite important. But you also notice that here the Institute of Medicine had produced a report to Erie's Human way back in about 1997 or 8, 99. And people hadn't paid it too much attention then. It got much more interest later on. So we now started to realize that from what we knew, knew that students actually could do much better if they actually went down wrong paths. So we started with medical error. And the next project was indeed called Training Against Medical Error, TAME. And about this time, we realized that we had all these partners working together in all these areas. And it was time to try and start creating a network. At the same time, we were still left with the problem that um, scenario-based learning was in a very small number of people's hands because of the technical limitations. So WAVES, widening access to virtual education scenarios, was trying to widen access. And in widening access, it's also trying to bring in business because 
SBR was used in business, and also other disciplines. And it goes on with new projects which were involved in team-based learning, high-fidelity simulations, and carrying. Now, what I want to do is to pick out one or two projects, actually, to, to detail and to show what features they produced on this particular timeline. And I'll pick out EVIP and Generation 4 and EPBLNet and Cresis and TAME. A very brief mention of the network. EVIP was where it all started. Um, we had, uh, it began in 2005 in Europe. It starts with an American, Peter Green. We were thinking about a proposal to actually build a bank of virtual patients, and Peter Green was running around Europe trying to drum up interest in a new venture, which was to build a global healthcare standards organization. He spent about six months sabbatical doing this. And Peter persuaded me to persuade everybody else that it was actually worth um, adding a standard to this whole new project, that if we built a bank of virtual patients, it's, these patients should be able to move from one virtual patient system to another. And uh, the partners found this hard to swallow because it was very expensive to do, but we agreed, and it obviously worked because we got the, the grant. And the grant was to create a shared online bank of virtual patients adapted for multicultural, multilingual use for improved quality and efficiency of medical and healthcare education across the EU. And the impact was that in inevitably it worked. Oh, sorry, these are the partners. Um, I, I did want to say something about this. As you can see, it's George's carriers. It's UK, uh, Sweden, Germany, Holland, Germany again, Poland, Romania, and collaborators from um, Mabiquitous and, and the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. That's all of us. Uh, and this is the beginning of this partnership, and you can see it's all Western Europe and maybe a couple of Americans. So it's all the developed countries already. What was interesting about this was that, and I hadn't realized this until I went back to all the pictures, but almost all our meetings when we were writing projects actually happened in cafes. And that was really interesting. And I realized it was because we couldn't afford to actually rent or hadn't got the opportunity to rent rooms at Amy or wherever it might be. So everything, that's actually a, one of the drafts of the first bid. Uh, impact. We built the bank. It was fine. Um, we created the standard. The standard initially was, <laughs> it was a really good standard and then nobody used it. And now they're using it far, far more than we ever expected. It's actually becoming quite useful now, isn't it? As we move virtual patients around uh, between projects and programs and everything else. Uh, and we increased accessibility. Um, and if it was characterized by unexpected successes, and I was told about one of these successes uh, yesterday by one of the people here. Um, first of all, there was a fourfold increase in publications triggered by the project. You could usually find that some of these projects had a track back to EVA. You could always find it. But the other thing was that um, it launched the research careers of several EVIPers, as we called them, and others, and some are here today. And of course, that was the one that was mentioned to me. Um, and that's what's actually driven scenario-based learning over the last 10, 12 years. But what we didn't do was take the pedagogy any further. So we just actually really created virtual medicines. Um, this was our local project, uh, Generation 4. Uh, it was a generation of interactive virtual patients for problem-based learning. And we called that DPBL, decision-based PBL. Now, as I mentioned, um, PBL was getting a bit tired, and this was our way of trying to reactivate it. Uh, and we called it Generation 4 because we said that the first generation, and by the way, this is actually what sold it to the funders, um, the first generation was um, uh, didactic teaching, telling somebody about a particular subject, neuroscience or whatever it might be. And the next generation in medicine and healthcare was, that, okay, at least it's now system-based, we're teaching through systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, whatever it might be. Um, the next stage was the PBL, collaborative learning stage, case-based but linear. And generation four was interactive with options and consequences where the student actually got control of the case. And we did it. Many of you, unfortunately, have seen this before. 
It doesn't make it any less valid. Um, we did it by taking the paper, turning it into a, an online um, program of patient history, patient examiner, oh. patient presentation, history, examination, etc. And then at key points, point, always points of management, adding optional routes through the case. And it would look something like this. So when you're working through the text, you'd then be presented with a series of options. And, and the students love this. Um, and we also learned quite early on that going down the wrong path was, was really important because students memorized, me remembered that much better. And we had phrases like, we tried and tried and still killed the patient. I'll never ever forget that. So we were starting to realize that error, using these kind of cases for error might be a very good idea. But it was a bit subliminal still at that time. So we were more interested now in getting this out. And we got it into EPB and Nets. Uh, and, this was, and this was starting to spread the partnership out across Europe and Asia and Eastern Europe. Here are the European partners. You can see them, Aristotle, University of Thessaloniki, St. George's, Nicosia. And then Georgia, Georgia, here it's here for Georgia. Kazakhstan's there, there. Uh, Ukraine, yep, yeah, okay. This is a project long ago, it's still here. Uh, how did we do it? One of she tells best slides. Um, we reviewed the curriculum. It turned out that because many of these countries were post-Soviet, they had still had a very similar construction to their curriculum. And this made it much easier for us to actually think about this. And it fitted with St. George's curriculum. We don't know why. And uh, we reviewed their curriculum, or they reviewed their curriculum. Then they uh, worked out where to put our cases when they were adapted. Created a spiral. We're talking usually about years two and three in the partner countries. So a spiral across that. Uh, then we did training in case creation and in tutoring. Did all the development and testing. That was actually an interesting period. It worked and then embedded in the curriculum, and it went live. It was a huge program. I think there was something like 54 cases typically involved in this, so this was not lightweight. In fact, they should have lynched me for writing it in the first place, but they didn't. They were very kind, um, and it worked. So the impact. Students were extremely enthusiastic and chose PBL over alternatives. Tutors believe students perform better. Now, the clinical faculty noticed the improvement in, in competency, confidence, and engagement. And that was actually quite important when entering the clinical years. And the, prof the, uh, the rector of Zaporozhye um, told me, well, he told me, he told, we speak a lot, but only through interpreters, because I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, and he doesn't speak English. Um, but uh, he told me that when he went into the clinical areas and the clinical wards, the, um, uh, and met to meet his clinical colleagues after the students moved across into the clinical years, that they, he was, they were saying to him, what's happened? Your students seem to now understand medicine for the first time ever. They're no longer, pardon me saying so, they're no longer stupid. In transforming the curriculum, this began a process of continuous review and change, and of course it increased prestige regionally. One of the partners then ran the next, having not had a EC project before, then ran the next one. You know who you are. So, moving on from EPA Bionet, we moved up to Croesus. Uh, how Daniel Schwartz got Croesus out of this um, is just amazing. You know, clinical reasoning skills enhancements with the use of simulations, Croesus. Absolutely very, very imaginative. Uh, trained teachers to develop scenario-based learning tools and virtual patients to enable future physicians and professionals to simulate important steps. How am I doing for time? Okay. And therapeutic processes before exposure to patients. Oh, really? 
It's a really good thing because we're moving now from the university into the clinical years. And it was another important step. Um, it appeared to be just three partners, which was George's and um, Mazarak and, um, and Pavel Osef Safarik University. Kosika, Kosika. But it wasn't because Daniel actually led this big network called Mefanet, which was a network of all the medical schools in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So everything that we did was transmitted to this particular network. And so this is more back in the concentration in what we would then have thought as the new EC countries, the 11 extra countries added in 2004 or five, whenever it was. It was, the feature of this particular um, program was, I would say, training. That what we were doing here was, we were teaching people not so much to adapt cases, but to actually invent their own. And um, inventing their own, they were then having to go through the whole process from beginning to end of making these cases relevant, moved into um, really big follow-up situations of test and review, test and review, um, they had to present the cases properly, and because of this Mephonet network, they would actually then have to be presented and criticized at the Mephonet conferences. So it was a very complete system. And we learned a lot from it, by the way, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, so impact. Staff were trained. It's fine. Unexpected outcomes. In broadening the scope of VPs to clinical training, we were starting to realize that the type of scenario used needs to be matched to two factors. Uh, one is the pedagogic cognitive requirement, and the other the type of learning activity. And I haven't got time to explain that now, but just to give you an example. If you're in a collaborative learning situation, then the case feeds back to you what you need. You don't get feedback from it. But what you do want is lots and lots of discussion, so it's got to be challenging, you want to branch in cases. But if you're doing it online on your own, you don't want to talk to yourself. You just want to get through quickly, and you want instant feedback. So there's a different modalities coming out as to the kind of virtual scenarios that were really tailored to individual requirements. We moved on again. Um, by this time, we learned that doing things the wrong way was really instructive, and now everyone became concerned about the very high rate of error in medicine and healthcare. Uh, and there are whole charts of these, and it really is quite extraordinary. Um, for patients who represent at hospital, um, something between 20 to 30% of patients actually are representing because of error in, in every country across the globe. So this one was uh, interesting because <laughs> we got, got Karagandar to lead it. We wrote a lot of it, got them to lead it, and they led it very well. Uh, and it was Kazakhstan, Ukraine, now Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam, yeah. all right. <laughs> um, and St. George's and Karolinska and Masaryk and uh, Arist and off again. And we've moved out a bit further. We're filling in the blanks a bit more. Um, this, this was a three-year project, again, funded by the European Commission. The objectives were to create suites of virtual patients to train against medical error. Uh, St. George's created the virtual patients for pediatrics and the assessment system for pediatrics to embed these error cases into curricula of six universities in Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Vietnam. Each university used a suite of pediatric cases for year two, and then they created their own cases for their subsequent year in any subject they chose. Now, we had learned that we had been doing a huge amount of work with multiple countries, but really hadn't been doing the research. And we had learned from this, and now we started to talk in terms of researching the impact of virtual patients on exam performance in controlled trials in each country. And now there are lots of uh, Vietnamese have just been sent us two um, uh, drafts to consider. 
there are lots of papers going to be coming out of now the TAME project, so we have learned that we must actually get the message out there. This is going to be a little bit difficult to present in just two slides, I have to warn you, so I'll do my best. In each country, we had three groups of students in each university. One group would receive a decision-based case like the one that I showed you before. The second group would receive a linear case, in other words, without all the branches on it. That linear case would actually contain some error, so they were actually getting some training in error. There'd be a third group which received conventional teaching. Five minutes, five minutes. The third group received conventional teaching. Right, then all these students then did the same assessment, whether they did decision-based uh, decision cases, linear cases, or no VB cases. And then the assessments that they all did contained three types, oops, contained three types of questions. Questions directly on the decision points in the case, Questions related to the case, but not to the decision points, those points where the students actually made choices, the decision points, and general questions around the case or discipline. And of course, you can imagine now, we've got six universities doing the same thing. So this is quite a powerful approach. Uh, this is the data. Um, I'm gonna try and break it down a bit because it looks a bit intimidating as it is. Uh, Here's the assessment along the bottom, assessment scores. Uh, these are, flowed, these are uh, what are called watercourt diagrams of the distribution of the students' marks. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but I'm going to work with one first. So, these students received um, a uh, decision based case. The blue ones produced a linear case, got a linear case, and the green one's got nothing at all. And you can see that in the scores, the decision-based one did better. That was in questions related to the decision point. If you look at questions related to the topic, then there's not so much of a difference. If you look at the general subject, there's no difference at all. If you then look at all of them, what you can see is that there is a consistent shift with the decision-based, students doing decision-based cases doing better in questions related to the decision point. When the questions aren't related to the decision point, one minute, they don't do much, there's not much difference at all. So, it suggests that when you train them against one particular error, you may not train them against everything else as well. That's our evidence so far. But anyway, it's a lot of data and we're quite pleased to have it. I'm moving off that now because I've got to get onto Waves quickly on my last minute. Waves addresses the challenge that Eve left behind um, to make scenario-based learning available to all disciplines through simplifying access, training guides, and our MOOC, which is great. Uh, the wet network, by the way, she told us going to talk about waves, so I don't have to. Um, the network, we've met, we're supposed to meet biennially. We're going to meet, we met two years ago, we'll meet in two years' time, we hope. How we find the money, I don't know. Uh, sharing outputs, uh, funded by combinations of resources, there is a MOOC. This is the MOOC. Uh, we've already run the MOOC in May, it did very well. Uh, we had around 1,600 plus learners from around 114 countries, and we felt we were getting the message out there. Before that, members of our team had gone out and done workshops for 30 people in one country, in one institution. Now we were getting the message out. And the next one starts on the 29th, if you're interested in joining. Right, what's next? I'm hoping actually to find out what's next from here, because we don't really want more technology. We do, we do know that, um, that SBL, 
It goes into the universities that we're going to be using simulation integrated with virtual patients, high fidelity simulation, low fidelity simulation, maximizing value, into, uh, putting much more into collaborative learning and team-based learning rather than PBL. Um, and then there's all the other subjects that can use it, but that's as far as we've got. That's almost the now, it's not the future. Business, pharma, virtual reality, we don't know. So what we'd actually really like to find out is what, where you think things are going, and maybe that's something you could think about today. So, ah, oh, I have got one last point, actually. We want to see more change, interchange, and we think funding is changing. There'll have to be more commercial funding because the funding for education, particularly from the EC, is going to dry up quite fast. Thank you.